The CEO of Spotify thinks that nowadays the cost of creating, quote, content is close to zero. Boo this man! Well, as a musician and a content creator, of course, that pisses me off. But also, I'm upset as a philosopher because he brought up Marcus Aurelius and his ideas surrounding Stoicism to make his broader point. And of course, I'm going to have to rebut his interpretation of Stoicism. But this episode's not just about my feelings and being upset at what this dude said. I actually want to bring in some real facts and figures to make my broader point. So I've got a special guest that's gonna help me out this week. Sarah King just recorded a major album and released it called When It All Goes Down. And we're not here to promote that album, even though kind of that's gonna happen a little bit. We're here to talk about exactly how much it costs for what aspect, and let's see exactly how close to zero we get. You just put out a new record. So you went to the studio, that cost, yep. then you did a campaign to fund the promotion. Yep. So that was, I at least know that number, but yep. I'll just let you speak because you have the more intimate knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So all told, if I have to look at the total cost of production and promotion for the record, so just those two things. So I'm not talking about like, you know, the cost of the, the musicians on the record or the lodging or the, you know, any of like the behind the scenes stuff, but just production, promotion and pressing. So like the cost of the of the actual physical merch to get out there. We are looking at a little over $30,000. Sarah, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, I got a couple of questions I wanted to ask you. So let me read you this tweet from Daniel Eck. Eck. I don't know how you say it. He's the CEO of Spotify. <laughs> okay. So, quote, today with the cost of creating content being close to zero, people can share an incredible amount of content. This is sparked by curiosity about the concept of long shelf life versus short shelf life. While much of what we see and hear quickly becomes obsolete, there are timeless ideas or even pieces of music that can remain relevant for decades or even centuries. For example, we're witnessing a resurgence of stoicism with many of Marcus Aurelius's insights still resonating thousands of years later. This makes me wonder, what are the most unintuitive yet enduring ideas that aren't frequently discussed today, but might have a long shelf life? Also, what are we creating now that will still be valued and discussed hundreds or thousands of years from today? There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First, I want to ask you what your first reaction is, but my first reaction is Twitter needs to bring back the uh, character, character limit. limit. Yeah, <laughs> that's like there, there's a lot like that should have been like four separate tweets. There's like four things that we need to unpack there. I mean, my first initial reaction to the first part of the statement about content creation being nearly free, um, I wholeheartedly disagree with that if we are approaching it from an art and an artistic perspective. Can you create content? Yes. What's the difference between art and content? And like, that's probably a discussion that we don't even have time to or time to dive into today. But I think that there's a fundamental difference between being a content creator and being an artist and working on your craft. Um, like, yeah, for me personally, like I am a live performance artist. And so like, yeah, my practice time and all that is free. But am I am I a great studio producer? No, because the skill and time of for me goes toward perfecting my craft. And I would rather hire people to do the production side and make sure it sounds good. So that includes, yeah, video production, audio production, all that stuff. So no, creating content like that is not free for me. Now, could I grab my cell phone and go sit in my backyard and sing songs for free? Yeah. The quality of that is like way different. And so then if we dive into point two of like the enduring quality of art, like nobody is gonna watch those field recordings done with my cell phone and no microphone and no production. Like people watch it for 30 seconds and then let it go. But my records that are done well and done right, people will continue to listen to those long after they've scrolled past the video of me sitting in a field singing. 
So like, yeah, those two fundamental differences of, of content versus art and craft. Um, what else did he say? Like a return to stoicism. I feel like the the ascent of AI right now is hopefully going to swing the pendulum back toward looking at what's the best way to say this? Like looking at human creativity and human art and respecting it for what it is versus wanting more, more, more of like the goldfish brain. Like I just, I want to see the next video, the next thing. Like I, I hope that people start to appreciate like long form art a little bit more, um, you know, like sitting through a 45 minute Beethoven symphony versus a three second TikTok clip of someone singing in a field. You know, I hope that we return to that and appreciate like the effort and the value that goes into creating the art that we enjoy. Um, and then like to his last point, like what what's going to endure and what are people going to think about hundreds or thousands of years from now? Like what has endured so far? You know, like we think cave paintings are fascinating, but we look at a cave painting for two seconds and we're like, cool, that's neat. We don't like read books of cave paintings, but also we don't know what we're looking at with that. You know, we don't know if that was supposed to be a quick communication or if that was some sort of like lasting thing that was was meant for people to see. And I think that's another issue here is like, are we trying to create content for for quick and easy consumption? Or are we trying to create good art because of the human experience or the shared human experience? Um, so I think I hit all of the four points that like really stood out to me. But I felt like my facial expression was just changing like every every five words, because that's that's a lot to unpack. That's a weird thing to say. And this is the Yeah, I've got a few thoughts on this. So first of all, yeah, this is a great example of why I don't think technocrats should be in charge of anything. When, mm -hmm. when we were young, I remember reading philosophy with my friends. Hey, we're still young, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when I was a baby, yes. I remember, you know, reading philosophy in the high school library with my friends, thinking that we were so smart. Mm -hmm. And I remember like we were talking, we would like lament that society isn't run by reason mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and smart people and at, on paper that sounds really like the perfect society right like okay society we're going to order it around the smartest people out there and and everything's going to be done with reason and data mm -hmm. but now that i see how people look at data i'm like ah and how they interpret so it yeah yeah because mm -hmm. i feel right like when you when you look at like yeah reason and data and intelligence and intelligence like it's i feel like there's a disconnect between that and again like that shared human experience like what makes humanity human and like i don't know yeah looking at like human creations as things to be consumed and and spat back out like that's that's not that that's an icky feeling and yeah. and yeah turning content creation into data and numbers that again are just churn i'm like that just takes away like for me the whole purpose of, of art is connection because like you know whatever genre of music you're listening to when you hear a song that resonates with you and is like man i'm not alone i feel this i understand that that vibes with me like that's what music is all about it's not like oh man the zeros and ones in that recording really spoke to me <laughs> to my data brain like it's nobody listens to music for that it's you want to be moved emotionally by something and it's that connection that like yeah humans are fairly unique you know again there are there are other species that do communicate musically but humans are fairly unique in that we create music to to communicate like abstract ideas like when when birds or whales or wolves call to one another and what we perceive to be musical they're sharing information like there's food over here danger is approaching blah 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 they're not sharing abstract ideas about like who wants you know, the fuck right <laughs> well yeah frogs do that like that's like this time of year that's what you're hearing it's like hot sex here whoop whoop like that's you know and and yeah there's plenty of human music that's like that but <laughs> there's also plenty of music about like you know like heartbreak and and things that like yeah like animal species other animal species are not singing about things that are not at present moment like biological needs and that i think is really cool and so yeah turning that into to content creation and and numbers is no it's it's not like yeah i feel the world should be run by like humanitarians people who understand the human experience or anthropologists something somebody who can see like yeah that it's the human connection that makes this whole thing worthwhile or, I think. or at least tempered 
by yes that, you know yeah balance so yeah back, back to the data thing he says the cost yeah. of creating content being close to zero now a lot of people <laughs> yeah. are interpreting that as he thinks that making music is free yep i don't think that's necessarily what he means he's just got this technocrat brain mm -hmm. here's the way i think about it if you listen to like a neil degrasse tyson talk about mm -hmm. uh the universe and he'll say that the the time the amount of time that humans have been in the cosmos if if all of time was a football field then the amount of time that humans were in the cosmos would be a single blade of grass yep near the end zone on the end zone yeah and in those terms that's close to zero yep and that is data it's factually true but what's left out of that data driven analysis is that blade of grass that small period of time is the most fucking important time in the cosmos to us humans yes yeah all those billions of years prior is basically meaningless to us mm -hmm. so and that's the sort of thing that gets lost in this view of things from the data you know i i see it in so many different things where like people in charge will look at like okay these statistics show that this is the move we should make and that on paper seems correct to me but what does that mean to that 10 percent that you know versus the 80 mm percent -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's why i don't think technocrats should be in charge of things that's why i think it's crazy that bill gates owns so much farmland it's like this guy runs computers like what right <laughs> yeah what is he doing and, yeah uh, and, okay and so then he wants to bring up stoicism and this is sort of like this is a sore subject for me. <laughs> I I understand why tech bros are really into stoicism now. And I wonder if they fully understand that because yes, Marcus Aurelius gave us some brilliant insights that will help us live our lives. But you got to remember this dude was a conqueror. Yeah. This guy conquered other people's. Yeah. He lived in a way that you cannot live right now. Like not cool in today's society. Yeah. And then he made justifications and yes. moral equivalencies after the fact. You know, yep. it's real easy for a guy to say, you know, it doesn't matter what's happening to you in your life. It matters how you respond to it when mm -hmm. you're the one doing the conquering. Yep. Yep. And I think that these tech bros, when they look at stoicism, they should reflect on that insight. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a it's a when you are I mean, we know history is written by the victors, right? So when you're the one writing history, it is so much easier to be like, well, sucks to be you, but everything worked out right in the end, right? Like you should just face it with courage. Like, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you on that. Like that's yeah, I, I can see why it's it's attractive to people right now in a world where we feel like, I mean, since 2020, we've been living in unprecedented times. Like, I've had so many people recently be like, dude, I just can't wait to return to precedented times. Right. <laughs> I'm tired of living in historic times. Like, yeah. And so when we are dealing with all of this upheaval, it is very easy to turn back to something that looks so simple on paper and be like, OK, yeah, we'll just face that and whatever. Like. But right, when you create the justification after and you're the one doing it, very, very different situation, so. And what is the parallel? So like, I wanna think about Spotify just recently announced that they're not going to pay artists unless they reach a thousand streams. So yep. this is a perfect example of making decisions based on data. Mm -hmm. you know, dude, if you can't get a thousand streams, I mean, you're not gonna make any money anyway right right a thousand streams will net you somewhere in the neighborhood of around three bucks yep and that's if the record company isn't taking all of it yep because the record company gets it all if you have it made back whatever it costs right if you money. haven't recouped yeah um so anyway from a data perspective that makes complete sense but for the people that are just now putting their music on and they're not all signed you know a lot of it's independent so they don't have mm -hmm. the record company to deal with and then if you don't think about it in from an individual artist standpoint think about how many artists are on spotify with less than a thousand now all mm -hmm. of a sudden the numbers mean something different 
Mm-hmm. If you're not going to pay who knows how many millions of artists who haven't reached a thousand streams yet, how much money is that that you made mm-hmm. that they're not making? Mm-hmm. And where is that money going to? Like, that's what I want to know. Like, because Spotify recently laid off a huge host of, of staff. And it's like, okay, so yeah, who is getting this money um, that you're taking away from smaller artists? And it's the the whole, the not paying up until a thousand streams thing, like that stands out to me a lot as well. Because yeah, so many tracks have less than a thousand streams. Um, and to me, again, not looking at the data because I'm an artist, I look at it and I'm like, well, a lot of people are putting up music that's actually not really up to snuff. You know, the Mm -hmm. production's not really good. Or, and I know Spotify's like, we're trying to combat noise tracks where people just go in a field, record crickets, and then stick it up there. And like, and I understand that, but that's what makes me feel like, like not that there should be some sort of gatekeepy thing, but there should be some sort of quality control that's like, you know what? If your stuff doesn't meet this like threshold of like, like the standard of a standard of quality that we're not going to accept it. So go back and get it to the standard of quality and we'll put it back up rather than being like, we're not going to pay you because you made this. Like, I mean, you know, you and I probably both had plenty of like recordings done in bedrooms that had terrible production quality, but at the time we didn't know any better, you know, and that was the budget we had. And I don't think we should be discouraging folks from doing stuff like that. You know, like that's how you get started. Not everybody can afford a big studio budget, especially when they're starting out. But if there were guidelines in place that was like, make sure that you're recording, you know, that you're recording at, you know, X, Y, Z, like kilohertz and all the other like formats that you need to have and make sure things are normalized and gated to make sure it sounds best on the platform. I feel like that would be be a way better way to like get rid of the junk tracks and focus actually on people who are trying to create music if there are guidelines and parameters in place but just being a blanket statement of like oh we're not going to pay you like well that's that's kind of discouraging like that's not you know that that's not not a good if you're if you're focused if if you're supposedly focusing on creating more quality content that's not how you're going to get there tell people like what does you know and you can't qualify art either but Mm -hmm. it's like if there are technical specs that will make your music do better on this platform give the people that let them know here's here's what to do if you want your music to to sound good in a playlist next to this make sure you're recording to those specs and people will be like okay cool i can do that we can't just go out and find a thousand people to stream our music if it's the very first thing we've ever done and we don't really know what we're doing and our production quality sucks. Yeah, two things there. Uh, first of all, I find it weird that they would say that they want to get rid of the noise content while at the same time signaling that they are open to AI music. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's, I wasn't going to go there, but yes. <laughs> if you want, If you're worried about flooding your platform you know, stop putting stuff like this out there and stop encouraging this. Like they literally have an ad that I heard on, on one station that was like, like go to this part of Spotify and download all our stuff that you can use for free to upload more tracks. I'm like, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. And and, and then the other thing is like you, you mentioned somebody's first, their first time recording an album yeah. in a bedroom somewhere. Like yep. people, when they think about the cost of recording an album, they don't factor in that all of us had to do that first. Yes. Yeah. Before we could go on to make bigger and better albums, we needed that experience in the garage, in the garage band, in the bedroom, recording with crappy equipment. You know, you can read a book about all the best practices, but every time you go in the studio, it's different. Yes. Unless you go to the same studio every single time with the exact same equipment and the exact same people and yep. the same format songs even. Mm-hmm, every time you mm-hmm. go in the studio is going to be different and you're not mm-hmm. going to be able to just turn it on one take. And done. Yeah. yeah. Nope. So all, and if you, all, yeah. All of that experience is a part of the cost. Yes. And if these same tech bros will be the first ones to tell you that time is money. Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. That, right. I mean, that's, yeah, like time is so much money. And that's, again, why, like, I'm not going to sit here and try to figure out how to perfect home recording because that's going to take up so much of my time. I would rather take my time, go out, play live, and then pay somebody else to to go to a studio where, like, yeah, I can do two, three takes and my my songs are good. I know they're in good hands. They can make it sound 
you know, as great as possible because I went in there well rehearsed from the state from the stage, you know, and I'm I'm ready to deliver a good performance. But if I had to sit there, like you said, and like read all the books about audio recording and then sit here and record myself over and over and over and try to figure out the specs and make sure everything sounds great, like that is not a good use of my time, like budget wise. Like and that was part of like my my math versus the indie musician series is it's not just the math of finances, but the math of time, the math of health, like the entire economy of being an independent musician is not just financial it is yeah time is money and so much else goes into it and like what is the cost financially and time wise of whatever endeavor that you're trying to figure out musically because yes we did have to put that time in those early recordings sitting in someone's bedroom or someone's garage learning how to play guitar learning how to record ourselves that sort of thing but that's not what people see now that we've leveled up and we're working with professional studios and we're and we're going out on professional tours but it took a long time time to get there there's no such thing as an overnight success in the music industry there's always money there's always time behind any overnight success right right yeah I think about bands like sleep token or bad omens that are blowing up right now mm -hmm. and you find out sleep token was out there you know performing in 2016 mm -hmm. before they broke yep so, but i'm glad you brought up your math versus indie musician series because that's actually why i wanted to talk to you and then we went off on a few tangents <laughs> <laughs> so expl explain to us what what that means in terms of dollars like what is the cost of creating content being close to zero for you you just put out a new record so you, you went to the studio that cost yep. then you did a campaign to fund the promotion. Yep. So that was, I at least know that number, but yep. I'll just let you speak because you have the more intimate knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So all told, if I have to look at the total cost of production and promotion for the record, so just those two things. So I'm not talking about like, you know, the cost of the, the musicians on the record or the lodging or the, you know, any of like the behind the scenes stuff but just production promotion and pressing so like the cost of the of the actual physical merch to get out there we are looking at a little over thirty thousand dollars that's a lot of dollars that is a lot of dollars for an independent musician um the reason i had to think for a second is because because of that number is so large, my recording was split up into a few sessions. So I had to think back to what the cost of each each session was. Um, and then the cost of, of the, so the promotion, the Kickstarter campaign, that was $15,000 for the for the promotion and all of that. But um, yeah, we're looking at a little over $30,000 to make one, one little CD with 12 songs that y'all have been listening to. Um, and when I throw those numbers out at people like, I've had some people be like, oh my God, oh my God, like that's highway robbery or blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, actually, that's it's cheap. not. That is cheap. That is cheap. And trying to explain that to folks. Like, so when someone says like content creation is free, I'm like, no, 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 it's not. But that's the difference again between me just making a little video here in front of my computer and making a good quality recording that will stand the test of time because the recording and production are up to snuff and i hired a good team to get it out to people you know yeah i could i could make a little video here and i could just do nothing with it and just post it on my socials for free and blah 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 but that's not what's going to get me in front of people and get me a larger audience and ultimately make it so i can make that money back and again, with my priority being a live performance artist, my goal is to get out on stage and I tend to make most of my money from live shows. Um, ticket sales, mm, and we could have a whole separate discussion about like Ticketmaster and, and ticket right. sales and all that stuff right now. But most of my money, or I make a lot of my money on the road from merch. Um, so that was a big factor in my production and promotion cost as well, was making sure that I had money to get the t-shirts and CDs and vinyl made because those... Um, those are not cheap and a lot of people so in your situation like you're able to do print on demand because you are not a live performance podcaster that would be kind of weird but <laughs> i guess it maybe exists, if you were like I, it's not it, for me. yeah yeah you, you'd have to have a studio and a setting for and so you'd be paying rent on that like there's you know but in my case where i'm traveling i have to actually order ahead of time have it on hand like hand carry merch um versus print on demand i do have print on demand options but that is not my main 
right. way, like a financial sustainability on the road. It is hand carrying merch that I can sell to someone at a show and then make money back. Um, and so I am not on, like I'm on a very, very teeny tiny indie, indie label, self-funded. Um, but I have to, like, I still have to recoup those costs. And so there is still, there's what we call also like a point system when it comes to production that once I make back a certain threshold of what I made, I start having to send royalties to the production team. Um, and so <laughs> like in the event that I hit that number, which would be great, but I'm nowhere near that yet, then I, then, then money starts coming off the top for me. And so it's, it is crazy to think about like, so $30,000 is not where it ends. Like that is where right. it begins. And then other people are going to start taking from once, once, once I've made my 30,000 back, more people get money. So yeah. So <laughs> I want to address two things with that. So, some people will hear that they'll hear that 30,000 number and like yep. you said their minds will be blown yep and they'll go you you don't have to pay that much you can yes you can record at home you know but yep. it's like you, you don't understand like yes if you want to make your solo bedroom black metal project and use a drum machine mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. absolutely you can record at home for way less than thirty thousand dollars Yep. But that's not the kind of project you're making. Correct. The kind of project you're making, 30,000 is cheap, especially yeah. for the team that you have behind it. You know, you, yep. you hear stories about um, bands getting 100,000, 200,000, 250,000, even half a million sometimes advance mm -hmm. to record a record, you mm -hmm. know. That's not just the that's not just the record company going, "Here's some money, record a record." Like, yeah. You, you go to a certain studio with a mm -hmm. certain producer mm -hmm. and you have a certain engineer and a certain mastering. Like if that's the level you're at, that's how much it costs. Right, right. And, and, and explain real quick, like who was the production team on your record? Yeah, so the production team, um, I'll answer that in just a second, but when you were throwing out those other numbers, like the 100,000, 250, so like it is estimated right now, so in my genre of Americana, um, that it takes at least $100,000 for a record to actually break. And so when I say, oh, I spent $30,000, it's like, well, that's cute. <laughs> like, you know, $100,000. Yeah, it is cheap. If you have, if you can put $100,000 into the record between the production and promotion, that's the level you're going to get where you're like, where you can break. Um, and so I'm not there. And it's like, I don't know when I will get to that point because those are big numbers, big numbers. Right. It took me from, for, so the last record I released was in 21. It took me three years to get enough money to do this one. And so I'm like, what, am I going to wait 10 years to do another record? No. Um, <laughs> but that's, you know, goes along with, with things earlier about like the money that I get from playing live and stuff. Like until I'm making that kind of money, you know, I've got to take my baby steps up the way. Um, so the production team on this record, um, I had David Barron was my producer, who was one of the co-producers of my previous record. So David um, hasn't worked with a lot of metal artists, but <laughs> he's worked with um, the Lumineers, um, Megan Trainer, Noah Khan, Lana Del Rey, Matt Mason, um, Lenny Kravitz, um, just so many names that people, you know, regardless of genre, you have heard these names. And so for me to work with him, like that's, it's not that like, oh, I need that to like make me sound good because I don't sound good with a producer. No, but a guy uh, that skilled is going to cost money. Yes, exactly. And what he's going to do is bring my songs to life. Like you've seen me perform solo and like I love playing solo. I also love playing with a band. But again, thinking of streaming and thinking of like what what catches people's ears when they're listening, they're really not going to be caring about some solo like guitar and vocal like they want a nice production that the song sits in and catches their ear. And David has an ear for these, for songs uh, or for production to bring songs to life. And that's why I work with him versus just me in my bedroom being like, well, I think that sounds cool. Like David can hear a song once and be like, it needs this, 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 and this for instrumentation. We're gonna set the BPM here. We're gonna make sure, you know, Sarah, you're gonna sing like harmonies on this part. You're gonna do this like, and also when I'm when I'm playing live, I can only play like one guitar line at a time. And most of my songs I'm dubbed over and over on the guitar because I'm adding layers and layers to build up the track. Um, 
And so that's why I work with with a producer. Um, so he was the main producer. Renee Hekari was um, the assistant engineer. And so it was great to have a woman in the studio. Um, mm. Super awesome to, you know, to not just be like in the boys club. Um, Renee is also a drummer and a singer. So she added a lot of background stuff to the record. Um, and she just also has great ideas. Like, you know, I would record some stuff. I'd leave the room for a little bit and come back and be like, yeah, that's a that's a vibe. Like, that's really cool. So they were the main um the main studio people in there you know i brought other musicians and stuff in but as far as tracking and all that i also did i recorded a couple lines for one of the tracks at a studio in vermont with um urian hackney who is part of the armed so um some of the people in your audience might actually know the armed but he's the drummer for the armed um and so we recorded a few things with him before we brought everything back over to david to finish up so so the the point is Yes, you might have a friend who owns a studio locally and nothing against that guy. He's probably super talented. Yep. But he doesn't have those credentials. Correct. But, you know, and it, he's probably good enough to have those credentials, but he doesn't got them yet. Yes. And so that's why it's cheaper to book at his studio than it is at this studio. Yep. So for you to work with people like with those credentials and if it costs 30,000, that's why I say it's cheap. Mm -hmm. But, and that's it. Yeah. Because like, right. And a lot of folks have said that to me, they're like, Sarah, like, you know, you could record like up the street and it would be a lot less money. And like, you know, is it the ears or the gears that the experience is it the awards on the, on the, on the wall. And I think a lot of it for me, honestly, working with David is the efficiency because he has those credentials because of the experience he has we can work very very fast with david whereas if it was here and it was like someone's studio so it would be like less expensive but we'd, we'd have to sit there and think a lot we'd have to be like okay what are we going to do next how are we going to do this whereas with david like his his strength is is arranging and figuring out what we're going to do and he he does it very quickly um and so that allows me to get a lot done in a short amount of time as well whereas yeah if i'm recording with a bunch of friends would be like okay that sounds cool but then like does it really do we have to like do something else to it um and yeah to be able to work with someone at that level that is like i absolutely am getting like a bargain to to have somebody with that many platinum records to his name to be working with me and to to walk out of there yeah thirty thousand dollars and have a record like holy shit that's <laughs> that's really cheap but it's not cheap to me like if i look right. at like my gross receipts from the last year were more than thirty thousand but they weren't a whole lot more so like, yeah, it's like I've spent about 75% of my salary for the year on one record, you know, like that's, that is not insignificant. That is yeah. not cheap when it comes Something to thinking. Something here of is close to zero, free. but it ain't the cost of content creation. Yes, <laughs> it is my bank account. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and okay, so I think a lot of people won't be able to relate to spending $30,000 on a recording, but I think everybody will be able to relate to this. Okay, now your recording's done. Whether yep. or not you went to a big professional studio or you recorded at home, your recording's done. Yep. Okay, and now you've got to try and get people to listen to your recording and they don't know who you are. Yep. Anybody that's ever done any artistic endeavor ever, whether you're a painter, a musician, if you've got a YouTube channel and you've got 10 subscribers, why should anybody listen to you on YouTube? It's the it's the hurdle that mm -hmm. every artist has to deal with. When you're nobody, mm -hmm. why should anybody give you the time of day? Because you've got things like Spotify with a gajillion options. Yeah. And and, and yeah. so they're saying they're trying to cut down on the junk content, right? Yep. Cut down on the noise. You've got to be able to cut through the noise to get people to listen to you. Maybe you've mm -hmm. got the most amazing record ever recorded, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you've got to get past that first obstacle to get of somebody giving you a chance and listening to you when they've already got The Weeknd and Metallica and, and all these other bands to listen mm -hmm. to. So $30,000, forget that. Now mm -hmm. it's time for promotion. Mm -hmm. That's where that next 70,000. Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, 
Right. Like if I if I had the hundred thousand dollar budget, yes. So there's there's actually a lot of worksheets that say like whatever you spent on, like depending on your genre, you look at how much you spent on the production and it is it is a ratio of that to promotion. And yeah, oftentimes it's like double. So like my thirty thousand dollar figure included my promotion. Um so the promotion that I had for this, and that was what the Kickstarter was for, it was $15,000 worth of promotion um, between radio, publicity, um, ad spend, marketing, graphic design, like all of the stuff that's, yeah, gets me in front of people. And it is, that's the million dollar question. Like, how do you get in front of people who have so many other options to listen to? Like Spotify gets that 70,000 tracks uploaded a day. So why should somebody pick my little song out of everything else? Like you need to have compelling images right number one like we listen with our eyeballs first and so um compelling images for your for your album for your artwork for your website everything has to look good um compelling video so that when people are scrolling through and they see something they're like this is cool you need to have a publicist um who can help tell your story because if you don't have a compelling narrative nobody cares about the music um and then you can, yeah, you can look at like playlists, um, like curated playlists. I wouldn't necessarily do like a, like a Spotify, like pay to play thing, like don't do that. But if there are people who have playlists, yeah, taking the time to reach out to them and be like, I think you'd like my track. So there's that type of promotion and then terrestrial radio promotion, depending again on your genre. So me being Americana, like terrestrial radio has been a big help for me um, with my last record. This record has been a little bit trickier, but that's because of what's been going on with me personally outside of, of the record um but yeah to get all of that together like and and it should be an ongoing thing like a lot of folks will hire someone for a record and for promotion or um for publicity and then it'll be like two or three months of promotion and that's it that's what you get mm -hmm. and when you hire a publicist um you pay a flat fee it's not like it's a percentage or something you just play, pay a flat fee and there's no guarantees and you and i have discussed this often about the money that you pay to a publicist versus what you get back. And it's typically, yeah. it's the long game. Like when you hire a publicist for X amount of dollars, you are not gonna see that dollar back in your bank account. But you might see it after a couple of years when enough people have heard about you. But how many dollars have to go out first before they start coming back in? So yeah, if I had unlimited budget, I would have absolutely put $70,000 into the promotion of this record. Um, so but you put yeah 15 so that that puts yeah F grand 15 total 45 we'll, we'll say 50,000 yeah yep i would say yeah about yep 50,000 yeah probably total with everything with the recording and the promotion yeah and so that that's, that's a lot of so that's my gross receipts from the year dude <laughs> like that is a lot of money <laughs> and i think that's what he means by close to zero cuz this is the guy that's used to <clears throat> looking at billions of dollars yes yeah to him fifty thousand dollars is a drop in the bucket he'd be like wow like she can't be serious about her career because she only spent fifty thousand dollars on it whereas you and i live in the real world fifty thousand dollars is a big a lot number of fucking money. Yeah. a lot of fucking money yeah and that the publicist thing is a great point because a lot of bands i've, I've been here yep you get if you get to the level where you like start thinking about hiring a pr person and then you put out some feelers and you find out how much that shit costs. And you're like, Jesus Christ, yep. how yep. are we going to make any money? You know, we, we finally started making like enough to eat a sandwich when we, when we yeah, when you're on the road. Yep. And now this person wants thousands of dollars. Yeah. And yeah. I can tell you, cause I get ever since heavy metal philosophy got to around, I'd say around 600 subscribers is when I started mm -hmm. getting emails from PR people. I never asked for it. And they just mm. they just found me found you yep yeah yep and and the, the over the years i've gotten more and more and now every day my inbox is pr oh emails. my god yeah and i can tell you they're not all created equal yep yeah you, you it's that's oh my god i can't imagine trying to we could have an people. entire episode <laughs> on you gotta pay yeah. them those thousands of dollars and i'm telling you not all of them are created equal some of them are really great really mm -hmm. really great they you know th they really try to get their bands out there they actually listen to their music mm -hmm. i can tell by mm -hmm. what they say in the emails that they've actually listened to the record didn't get chat GPT to write the email and the, you know, right. they're actively looking for people like me to talk about the record. And then I just get some that just, I can tell it's just MailChimp. Yep. And yep. every mail blast. Yeah. yeah. And you pay them thousands of dollars to just go. Yeah. Bloop. 
Yeah. Like I could have done that myself. Like that goes back to the time versus money thing. Right. So like when it comes to radio and publicity, I did have a few folks tell me both of my last record and this record. They're like, well, why don't you do it yourself? And again, for me, that goes back to my time is better spent writing, practicing and performing because those are my strengths. I am good at writing emails, but I don't want my whole thing to be like my publicist. One of the reasons you hire a publicist is because they already have the contacts like yeah, a role they should be. Yes, they should be out there seeking out outlets like you to feature their bands, and they should be on top of that. Like, if I'm writing and performing and on tour, I don't have time to do that. And if I do have time, I'm probably not doing my job right. I'm probably slacking off and, like, scrolling around. And so I think it's better to divide and conquer. Everyone has a different perspective, and, like, if you have unlimited time... And you can sit there and look for the outlets. Yeah, go for it if you're a good communicator. But I know you two, you've gotten emails from people. It's just like a link to a, an album. And it's like new album. And, so, and you're like, okay, what do you want me to do with this? Do you want me to play this? Do you want me to review it? What do you want me to do? <laughs> or, or they'll send it to me after it's released. And I'm like, yes. Guys, yeah. Guys, okay. Yeah. Get on top of it. Yep. But, but also, like you said, some people will say to you, like, you know, why don't you do it yourself? And it, that's yeah. hilarious because it's like, we yep. complain about the studio costs. And they go, yep. why don't you do it yourself in your bedroom? And then I've yep. done episodes about AI art. Yep. And it's and it's like, well, you can just, why don't you just do that yourself? It's like, yep. Uh, publicist, it costs, well, why don't you just do that yourself? And it's like, you know, it's like, okay, if I'm doing all these things myself, like, what, yes. what does my day look like? When am I going to play it? When am I going to play guitar? Like, seriously, that's what it boils down to for me is like, what is my priority? Why did I choose this career path? Because I like performing. I do not like doing all the other crap. Like if I wanted to do all that, I would just have a regular job. I'd make a shit ton more money. I'd be able to play guitar for funsies and I wouldn't have to worry about it. But I would rather perform music. And so, yeah, it's like I do have to wear a lot of hats, but like... I don't have to be an expert at any of those things. Like, I think it's a good idea that I know I have the basics down for everything because it also helps me know whether the people I'm hiring are doing a good job because right. I can kind of spot check things and be like, did you know about this outlet? Do we need to like revisit the graphic design here? Do we need to like whatever? Um, so that helps. But yeah, I don't want it to be my full time job. And I think it's also a good practice to hire other people. Like there are other professionals for a reason. Like if something's wrong with my toilet, could I look it up on YouTube and fix it? Yeah. Should I? Probably not. Like, <laughs> there are other professionals for a reason. You know, it's the same thing with, like, I don't know, if someone's like, oh, um, like, I... I decided I wanted to teach my kid how to play guitar. Like, okay, cool. Do you play guitar? No. Then why didn't you hire someone who plays guitar to teach them how to play guitar? Like, allow everyone who has our specialties to be a specialist in whatever we do. Um, and that, I think, creates a stronger economy because more people have more jobs and, and there's more money. Like, like that money that came through from my Kickstarter, I did not see a penny of it. That came right through me and went right back out to pay all the other people who were helping me out with stuff. Um, well, that's a bummer for my bank account. I think it's great to be able to pay other professionals to to do their jobs. Like, I want to get paid fairly to be a musician. I want the publicists and promoters and designers and musicians to all be paid fairly for working with me as well. Um, and that, I feel, could also be like a discussion for another day is like, yeah, the, the economy of independent music. It's not just the musician or the venue. There's so much behind it. Again, that football field of everything that goes into the content creation, yeah. there's a lot that happens before before i hand you a record and say look look what i made yeah and th that brings me back to an earlier point you're talking about how you make most of your money going out and playing live and yep and selling merch and it's just because of shit like this with the spotify deal it musicians make money for other things mm-hmm <laughs> you, you yeah. basically have to have a side gig to be a musician yeah, yeah, I'm a t-shirt salesperson. High, high levels. Yeah. You got big yeah. signed bands on major tours and, and they're like, yo, these merch cuts are killing us because that's how they make their money. Yes. Yeah. No, merch cuts are the fucking worst thing in the world. I'm like, did you did you guys hire the graphic designer and did you order the merch and did you carry it with you? Did you like lose out on your gas mileage because of the weight of the merch in the back of your van on this drive? You didn't? Okay, cool. Do you have somewhere to sleep tonight? That's great. Okay. So if I don't sell these, you know, if I don't sell 500 bucks worth of merch tonight and take that whole 500 bucks with me, I got to figure out where I'm sleeping because I can't afford to eat, sleep and put gas in the car if someone's taken 30, 40% of my merch cuts, like it's- And that's you solo. 
Yeah. Take a five yeah. piece band. Oh my God. Like, and I, you know, I've t- I take the band on, on some runs and some regional runs and stuff. And like, yeah, we have piled the entire band into a tent once. <laughs> like that was not the best thing we've ever done. We've put the entire band in one hotel room. And like, I, it is. I've, like, I've never why? had. My, no, one time I had my own hotel room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Another time part of our pay package. <laughs> Was we got a beach house rental for the weekend? Yeah, we played a festival on the beach, and they they hooked us up. That was dope. That's yeah, that's pretty sick. That's like, yeah. you know, yeah, one of those. That's like one of those stories. There's a reason I told you that story because it's like yes. never happens. Exactly. Yeah, like the, the festival that I played at a few weeks ago. Like, yeah, I had my own hotel room for three nights, and I was like, what? what this is amazing like my my own hotel room all me like i didn't have to be crammed in with someone i'd never met before it was my own room and like shuttle service to get me where i needed to go so i didn't have to uber oh that's dude oh i know i was like i was like you guys are amazing (laughs) like this is i did not have to uber anywhere i did not have to do anything except get myself to the area and after that everything was covered and i'm like this is artist forward and that's what we need to be doing like but again, I understand so many independent venues, like they can't afford that. You know, a lot of independent venues used to have like band housing, like upstairs or whatever. And a lot of them don't anymore. It's become an Airbnb. And like, we're all out here, like we're, we're all struggling together, man. Like we're all fighting the same fight. It's our individual fight, but we're all fighting the fight together. But yeah, at the end of the day, it comes down to like, okay, again, how are we going to make sure that everyone involved here is paid enough that this economy can continue? And so if the artists aren't getting paid enough to go out on tour, then then how are the venues going to make money and you know how are people going to get their merch like it's 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 just this this um little hamster wheel that just keeps going and going because every part of it every facet of this industry has um what was that article that i sent you it was the the misaligned incentives of the music industry right every single spoke of the wheel wants something different and that can that um will mean success for them but there's not it's like a zero-sum game there's nothing that like if all the spokes faced inward and we all had this one thing in the center of the hamster wheel would be success for all of us financial success and content success and all like it doesn't exist it's wild that like yeah what other industry could look at like all of these metrics and be like well if you meet this and you can't meet that and that means that cancels it out most industries you'd be like well if we hit these numbers that means we've had a successful quarter year or whatever music industry there's there's too many too many bosses too many masters and and yeah you need a hundred thousand dollars at least to pay all the masters to get to whatever level you're trying to get to it's insane to get past that obstacle of why should anybody listen to you yes yeah that's the you need a hundred thousand dollars to break the album that festival we were all the bands were behind the stage just hanging out you know and yeah there was this bar that uh sponsored the whole deal Mm-hmm. And they put one of the bands up in the attic above the bar in Florida mm-hmm. with no AC in the summer. And those uh, guys were like, dude, we stayed in this attic. It was awesome. And, and we were like, <laughs> you're like, that's cool. <laughs> Good job, bro. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, right. When, when we are always given scraps, then when something, when we get a shred of something nice, we're like, that's the most amazing thing I've ever done. And like, it shouldn't be that way. Like we should have as musicians, we should have basic things taken care of. You know, an, another friend of mine and I were talking recently about like, if, if you had to wear a uniform for work, they would generally provide you a uniform. They yep. would prov- like, what would a job typically provide? If you have to travel for work, they'll cover your hotel. They'll cover your your flights, whatever. And like, we don't get any of that. We have to buy all our own stage clothes. We have to pay for our own travel. Like it's all out of pocket. And so, yeah, like we don't have those basic, yeah, we, we just, we lose our mind over crumbs because we're starving. If we had like our basic needs covered, we'd be like, okay, cool. Yeah. Like, like I wish that we could get rid of the whole starving artist vibe because I, I feel like, you know, in other countries they have that. They literally like just give you money to be an artist because they understand how important art is to the shared human experience. But we don't have that in, in American society. And that's been definitely a big struggle of like, there are days I wake up and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> like, do I really want to be like sleeping on an air mattress on floors for the next 10 years, hoping that I find my hundred thousand dollars and I can break through? Yeah, it's, it's tough. But then I get on stage and I'm like, this is why I do it. Like there's, there's no other feeling like it. And so, 
yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be insane and continue going for it as long as I continue resonating with people and connecting with people and doing this together. Like we're, we're all in the suck together. So we might as well like, yeah, like bring people together and, and just kind of lift each other up with whatever, whatever art that we have. Um, but that also means I need your money. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> like it's not all hippies and rainbows when it costs money to do that. To, yeah, just to live. It's, yeah. We're not asking yeah. to be rich. So not at all. I, I, not I at interviewed all. Uh, this band, Black Tusk, and mm -hmm. they just got a new member. So Black Tusk cool. has been around for almost 20 years. Okay. You know, they're like 70, 80,000 monthly Spotify listeners. So nice. Yeah, yeah. Pretty good, you know. Not, yeah. Not Metallica, but doing pretty well. Yeah, they're doing solid. Yeah. And I, I asked the guy, the new guy, I was like, was it hard to be the new guy and join this like established band with like these established relationships. And he goes, no, he goes, I joined the band. We already got a gig. I got my own. Oh my God. Room. So yeah. The easiest band ever. I was like, yeah. Right. I, yeah. Okay. Cause they, <laughs> the hard work is there. Like it's our, the groundwork is again, that football field of hard work is already there. And he's just stepping in to be like, Ooh, I got the ball over the end zone. Whoop. <laughs> so I, yeah. I want to close with this because it's it sounds like we've done a lot of complaining oh woe is me we don't make any money right right you know we don't get paid to do this awesome fun thing mm -hmm. there's a problem with that though if if we if this economy does not continue into the future then all that's going to be left is going to be ai and bedroom music yep that's it yep because yep. Nobody will be able to afford to do the things that it takes to make mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. music levels above that. Yep. And I know somebody's going to to hit me with the exception to the rule in the comments. This album was recorded by one dude and is like, good. Great. Yeah, there are always exceptions. Yeah. Yeah. The, the reason why it's called an exception to the rule is because it's exceptional. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's that's yeah. not how everybody else does it, you know? Correct. So, like I said, we're not asking to be millionaires. I just, I just want to be able to eat and yeah. not, you know, my back not be fucked up from sleeping on rocks. Yep. That's it. Yep. Yeah. No, and I, and I like, yeah, I definitely want to make sure that um, that people know I'm not complaining um, because there has been like there there were some threads on on like X and threads and stuff a couple months ago where people were talking about like, here's the reality of what it looks like as an independent musician. It wasn't me. It was someone else. And they got so much shade in the comments from people being like, well, if you're complaining this much, like, don't do it. And I'm like, no, 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 no like I and others like me who are trying to pull back the curtain, we're not trying to complain and be like, I'm doing this super fun job, but it doesn't pay. Ha, ha, ha. It's not that it's I'm trying to pull back the curtain to just show what it actually looks like. Because so many people like I have people make jokes to me about like, well, when are you going to fly me around in your private jet? I'm like, bro, I get the cheapest ticket available. <laughs> like, We do not have these glamorous lives that people think that we have. And like, for those of us who are independent artists and continuing to fight the good fight and be like, I want to show up and do the best I can. And I want to play my real instruments on a real stage. Like I don't want AI music and I don't want drum machines and all that, like nothing against that. That's just not what I'm doing this for. I'm doing this again for that human connection and the emotional feeling and stuff. And so I just want to, I want people to be aware of what goes into this, what's behind the scenes to bring the music out there and, and to help get people to understand that creating music is not free. Um, it's amazing that we have radios and Spotify and all that, that we have music available to us all the time for free. I think that's phenomenal, but it's not free to make it. It's not free to get it out there. It's not free for me to go on tour because I got to put gas in the car. Oh, and let's not talk about all the equipment I had to buy that makes me sound good on tour, you know? Um, and so it's, it's yeah, it, I'm not complaining. I am trying to shed awareness or, or shed light on and bring awareness to like, not the plight of musicians, but just like the state of the economy right now. Like that's, that's the way it is. And this is why so many musicians turn to crowdfunding to ask for help or why we're selling t-shirts and why we care about merch cuts is because this is what reality looks like. Yeah. 
if I if I get a hotel room and two meals for the day, like two freshly prepared meals, I consider myself lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and like that that to me seems kind of like that should be kind of like a floor, not a ceiling. And right now it's a ceiling. And yeah, I don't need to be rich. Um, I don't even need that hundred thousand dollars to to break my record. You know, I'm doing okay right now with my with my thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. I'm doing okay. Um, but I would like to be in a position where I could record more often and I could do these things more often, but until the, the money like starts to equal out, I, I'm just, I simply can't do it. And if I recorded myself in my bedroom, you guys wouldn't want to listen to it anyway. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a process, but I'm here because nothing, nothing makes me happier than sharing my music in person live. And when people come up to me after playing and they're like, you know, your song made me feel like I'm going to make it through or you really resonated or you brought me to tears or you made me laugh. I'm like, then my job is done. Like my job of human connection was accomplished. And that's at the end of the day, like what it, why this matters to me. I think that private jet joke is hilarious because <laughs> we just talked about black toast. I got 70,000 monthly. Yeah. Lessons. Yeah. A lot, a lot for a that's metal. That's a lot. Band. Yep. They all got day jobs. Like it, it, see, it's, yeah it, it, people would be shocked of, of course like us indie artists you know we don't make a lot of money that's not shocking yep. people yeah. would be shocked at what established bands make like, yeah at hefe from trivium it is making more money from streaming on twitch mm -hmm. than he is mm -hmm. from one of the biggest metal bands on the planet right now mm -hmm. it's fucking crazy out there it's it's really crazy yeah and a lot of folks like if, if you are a musician and you have a day job right now and you have to keep it like there's nothing like I'm no better than you because I don't have a day job right now like you're probably smarter than I am because you probably have a 401k and you have money saved and you didn't blow all your money on a record and then quit to go on tour like there's no one right way to be an independent musician and I do think that it's it's important to bring awareness to that too that like yeah some people that you're looking at who are like wow they're really crushing it like if you look at their tour calendar and they're kind of doing like a lot of weekend dates and then a couple weeks here and there, I can almost guarantee you that some or many of the members of the band probably have a day job and are using their vacation to come play live for you. And that's that's dedication and that's really cool. And there's like absolutely no shade to, to people who are in that situation because you got to take care of yourself. Like I know that I'm in a unique position because touring on my own means my overhead is lower and that's why I could quit and play full time. But even when I'm home, like I teach music lessons. Like I don't, I don't only perform because I do need to make money while I'm home. I'm not making a ton of money. I'd make a lot more money if I had like a, a corporate job, but I do teach music lessons when I'm home because it works around my schedule. Um, but I, and I do that for myself so I can do whatever, but it's, it's tough out here for all of us at whatever levels and uh yeah it's it's not easy to to make music even even full time or even as a successful band it's not easy yeah it, 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 as a matter of fact the more successful the less being close to zero it becomes yeah yeah because then it's like right if you think about like i don't know like who could we think about right now like I I don't know. I can't think of some, but if you've got like a really big like production value and really high quality stuff, you are not going to be the person who's standing in a field taking a video with your cell phone. Like all of your content creation is going to involve a team putting it together. Right. So, yeah. And, and lastly, I'll just say, I really appreciate everybody listening because Americana and metal fans, I think, are the or the types of music fans that are the more likely to buy a vinyl, mm -hmm. to buy a t-shirt, because mm -hmm. that that really helps out because Spotify obviously didn't pay in. No, you want to know how much ones. money I made on Spotify last year? I made $500 off Spotify last year. Which like I could way more than most people. Way more than most people. And that's about what I make one at one live show from merch. So yeah like yeah the folks who like care about coming to see shows yeah americana and metal like come to the shows buying the merch buying the vinyl like being supportive and understanding that like yeah we're playing real instruments we have real amps we got to carry doing all this stuff like real human stuff and yeah i think it's yeah these two genres definitely are our are, are listeners and fans who are into this sort of thing um and your support is 
so integral to our success. If we didn't have folks buying vinyls and t-shirts, like we couldn't do what we're doing. Mm. So yeah. once again, thank you everybody. And speaking of showing support, buying vinyl and, and merch and all that stuff, Sarah, I'll have your website linked in the description. Y'all check out her new record. Uh, why don't you plug that new record real quick? All right. So this is my new record, When It All Goes Down. And uh, it is available currently on CD pre-order for vinyl. We're actually going to get those test pressings pretty soon and then we'll have the vinyl ready, but you can pre-order it on my website. Um, I have t-shirts that are on the way now um, that kind of all go with this. But um, yeah, there's 12 songs on here, including a song that was a metal tune and we reworked it and took it to the swamp. It's pretty bluesy. Um, so yeah, even if you're like a super metal fan, there's there's some some this harder rock and roll. This is the darker side of America. This is the so. darker side of it. Like, this is definitely not like straight up country um country americana stuff there's there's one song with pedal steel but there there ain't no honky tonking on this record this is i mean i'm literally blowing out a match here because i'm you know burning some stuff down when it and, all and goes down hold it up one more time yeah yeah so i just want y'all to look at the the quality of this cover and the look of it you know this that that's where the money goes i actually did this one myself but shh. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't press but, that yourself no that's true okay yeah so this was right so the the actual like the fact that there's a there's a case for it and stuff like yeah like i did not i did not like print out or um do a whole bunch of like duplicated cds and stick them in a case like this is this is all like yeah that's where your money goes i have a cool little like upc code and all this stuff like that's where that yeah the money goes to making things look professional like you could see this on a shelf in a store and in fact it is in some stores and like yeah looks like a legit record it's not you know yeah written on with a sharpie in a plastic jewel case that i've been kicking around in my car so yeah, done that yeah yeah we've done that plenty and that that's the thing is like you know like i have friends who like their merch their t-shirts they um they have stencils and they spray paint like the stuff on on which is really cool like that's it fits their vibe but like if i tried to do that with my stuff people would be like sarah what are you doing like yeah, yeah there's a vibe that kind of comes along with um that you know that is expected and so i'm like yeah i'm gonna deliver that we're gonna have that so yeah the money goes to making stuff like this look pro yeah well thank you so much sarah really appreciate you giving us some insights yeah let's see for today how do we wrap this one up um Thanks for doing this for next to nothing, Sarah, because I didn't pay you for your time. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't pay you. <laughs> Thanks for giving me content, Sarah. <laughs> it's all it's worth. Right? Yeah, that's that's what it is. No. Um, yeah, we created some free content. Woo! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> never mind. Anyway. Yeah, all that's of the... Enough. Never mind the cost of all this that we put into it. Yeah. Beating a dead horse, as I'm apt yep. to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, good luck with uh, with getting people to. Nope, that's really unprofessional too. <laughs> Thank me again. That was bad. <laughs> Devil.